CTV's W5. And so teachers at school hurt me. Special needs children suffering harsh treatment. Holding their hands, holding their feet, sometimes pinning them down to the floor. We knew we were overusing restraint and seclusion. We knew it. Some people are just not trained properly to do that type of job. And I'm still surprised he still wanted to coach after this. A beloved coach and a terrifying diagnosis. There were some tough moments that basketball kind of got me through. Honestly, if he wasn't our coach, I don't know if I'd be playing basketball right now. I'm not giving up on them. I'm not gonna quit. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome to W5. Imagine having a child with a disability and finding out they're being tied up and left in isolation at school. Believe it or not, it's happening right now across this country. W5's Molly Thomas investigates why some schools say it's necessary and some parents say it's leaving their kids with long-lasting scars. Ryan Vlad adds energy to any room he walks into. Come on, see. Goofy and playful with an infectious smile, it's easy for him to win people over. The 13-year-old has cerebral palsy and sometimes struggles with his motor skills. Oh, Roxy, so, you okay? But Ryan is strong and resilient, the way his parents, Rochelle and Carrie, have always raised him. And he has a, a, a smile that can light up any room. Like he's got a big, big smile and he, he cares about everyone and everything. Um, he's always willing to help out everyone. Good job, Ryan. <laughs> he's adored by his younger sister and brother and loved by his peers in the classroom. So he'd come back from school like happy. happy. Yes. Oh, yeah. He would always love when. At the beginning, he'd always love to go to school. You know, he can't wait to see so-and-so, and it was just, it was, it was great. His father, Carrie, was a familiar face Ryan would see after school. But March 29th, 2018, when this happy-go-lucky boy was just nine, something happened at his school in Lindsay, Ontario. And usually I go into the office and I say, okay, I'm here to pick up Ryan. They'll get him and they'll bring him down to the office and I'll wait. This time, I didn't even get a chance. They said he's down at the other end. He's been had a rough day. So I started walking down, and as I turn a corner and I go down the hall towards his class, there's a bunch of people standing outside, and they more or less pointed diagonally and said he's over there. I could hear him down the hall crying, and when I went close to the room, I saw him in there, and he was just crying hysterically. His father says when he found him, he was strapped down by a restraint in a chair and left in a room, secluded. I went to, to go and grab him. He kind of pushed back, and he had a buckle on him. And he can't do buckles, so he could never undo it himself or even do it. And when he went to push back, his chair, I, don't, I guess, almost got stuck. And with his weight and the size of him compared to the chair, started to lean back. So I had to kind of jump for it to mm -hmm. save him. What was it like um, for you, Rochelle, when, you're, when your son came home that day? So when he had come home and um, he was upset, I was like, okay, well, we'll just, I'll leave him be, I'll give him a moment and let him kind of gather himself. And then um, I was getting them ready to, for bed. I went to go and take off, remove his shirt. And I saw all these bruises up his arm and I, of course I was taken back and I was like, Where'd you get all these bruises from? He kind of looked down at it and said, teachers at school hurt me. Here are the bruises Rochelle found. Rochelle barely slept that night, thinking about what had happened. I remember crying all night over it, because I said to Carrie, we, we have to bring this to the police. Like, something has happened, and he's telling me teachers at school hurt him, and I believe him. The Vlads brought Ryan to the police station. They found that on the day he was restrained, Ryan was shrieking in the hallways. The Children's Aid Society also investigated and determined that Ryan's behavior that day was unsafe and escalated. They found the school's response did not meet the threshold for cruel and or inappropriate treatment. 
The Vlads were also shocked to learn that Ryan had been restrained three to five times before in that same school year. Is the school open about, yes, sometimes we have to restrain kids? No, absolutely not. The restraint policy is for when there is an immediate risk. The Vlads claim Ryan was never known to be abusive or aggressive. So they didn't understand why the school asked them to sign a safety plan a few months before he was restrained. It did not mention mechanical restraints. It only outlined the possibility of a brief hold if Ryan became a risk to himself or others. And even that did not sit well with the Vlads. They never signed it. So what was your understanding of that safety plan? The safety plan was basically stating that they could physically restrain my child. Right. But without any documentation, nothing to, to back up why they would even need a safety plan. And you folks were never aware that this was even possible. No. no. Reports by advocacy organizations across three provinces show the Vlads aren't the only family left in the dark. In Alberta, more than 75% of the 389 parents whose kids were restrained or secluded say they never gave their consent. In Manitoba, almost 70% of the 62 parents surveyed said they had never approved of this. And BC's report claims most of the 170 parents learned about restraints from their child, other students or parents, or because they witnessed it, not from the school. All three reports also point to the trauma, seclusion and restraints have caused. The Vlads watched Ryan fall apart too. Did you notice like a major change in him? He turned into a completely different child after it for a bit. I remember Ryan would just all of a sudden start to hum and rock. Um, if, if he even mentioned school, it, he would shut down and rock and hum. It was like he was zoning himself out from the world. Ryan's grades dropped. He found it hard to focus and he started having nightmares. I felt helpless. There was nothing you could do. You just, you kind of left him be and, and you know, you'd go in and rub his back and just tell him that we're there, you know? Right, because the aftermath was all on you. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it felt like we had to try to <clears throat> put them back together. I can't help when I talk about it. I can, I can still picture him. I can still hear him. <sighs> With a deep mistrust for the staff that cared for their son, the Vlads made the drastic decision to move their family to a new school district. Ryan was so shaken they both gave up their full-time jobs for more than a year to care for him. It sounds like it changed your whole family dynamic. Mm -hmm. It has. Um, it did take away a lot. A heavy toll. But it's hard to tell how prevalent this issue really is. W5 filed freedom of information requests with each province to see if anyone was tracking the use of seclusion and restraints. And only one recently started keeping tabs, New Brunswick. Seven provinces came back saying it would be up to the school district to track this information. We don't have correct data or accurate data because restraint and seclusion is not being tracked. Erica Cedillo is the Director of Public Policy and Programs at Inclusion BC. After the organization began receiving calls from concerned parents, she and her team sought input from roughly 200 families across the province to find out what was going on. What we heard were really troubling and distressing experiences where children, for example, were kept in, in rooms like cloakrooms or closets or in certain uh, other designated rooms in the schools um, behind locked doors. Um, and then the physical restraint, it happens in holding their hands, holding their feet, sometimes pinning them down to the floor. In most provinces, the use of seclusion and restraints is supposed to be a last resort in an emergency. But Cedillo says educators are quick to use it because it's an option. And when I connected with my counterparts across the country, we all have the same fears. And more often, this is happening to children with disabilities. So children are trying to explain to us, this is not working, something is hurting, I'm afraid. And where the way we are responding is to restrain them, to control them, and to shame them. 
South of the border, the U.S. Education Department has some startling data. Statistics from 2017 to 2018 found that more than 100,000 students across the nation's public schools were subjected to restraint or seclusion. Of those students, 78% were living with a disability. And there have been at least two reported cases of children who have died after being restrained, with one claiming a young boy stopped breathing after being held face down on the floor. Every parent thinks that their child should be safe going to school. When they leave your hand, it's like handing them over to another group of parents. So you think they would care for them like they would their own. So we never, never thought that this, something like this could happen or would happen. Coming up. There are times where words don't work. A new approach to difficult situations. There are right and wrong ways in doing things. When W5 continues. Not far from Canada's oldest city, St. John, New Brunswick, where the Bay of Fundy and St. John River meet. You'll find Chantal Hyde and her daughter Lily, who lives with non-speaking autism. Lily's 14 years old, but developmentally around the age of a two and a half year old. You just my faces. You're being funny. Yeah. Oh, she's always smiling and giggling, jumping around. Like I've had other children's parents look at her and say, my God, I haven't heard my child laugh like that in two years. You know, but she could look at me 100,000 times in the day and every time be so elated. It's like she hasn't seen me in a week. But in 2019, something changed in Lily. It literally got that bad where she would be on the couch and we couldn't even ask her if she wanted her favorite thing, cheese, you know, or what she just closed completely down. It, it, it was really concerning. And I, uh, so many times, honestly thought, I mean, I wish I could just, you know, send somebody with her, put a fly on the wall, do you know what I mean, so to speak, to just understand what's happening that's creating this. Chantal was left confused and concerned until finally another mother from the school told her what she had witnessed. And she walked by a room, seeing Lily on the inside of a glass window door, screaming and slamming her hands on the window while, sorry, while an adult used their full weight to hold that door closed. I'm sorry, I just, I picture this happening and I just. Lily was trapped, secluded and alone in a room. I didn't know anything about it. She, Lily doesn't speak very much, and she'd have no way to tell me that this happened at school. Instead, she looked at me every morning at the school bus stop, pleading and saying no. But I didn't know what was wrong. The same mom that saw Lily stuck in a room crying out for help also told Chantal that this wasn't an isolated incident. And she just said, there's no way that child's mother knows that this is happening. And her son, when she looked at him and said, does this happen all the time? He said, yes, that's Lily's room. That's Lily's room. It was known to be the room where she was. So this has happened she, before? This happened three times. Chantal says she was not informed that her daughter was acting out in school. These data sheets from the day before Lily was secluded show that she was trying to bite and scratch herself and an EA, and even threw herself on the floor. Chantelle was not notified. She pushed the school for answers. And so they shoved two weeks worth of data sheets in her backpack, and as I read them after, I was seeing hours and hours worth of total distress, absolute chaos. You're saying there should have been at least a phone call, at the minimum. Absolutely, there should have been a phone call, and to be honest, I'm certainly an expert on Lily. I might not be an expert on all things that I need to do outside of Lily, but I am a Lily expert. And, you know, if, if there was any moment that you thought that things were out of control, for me not to know about it means I can't help her. Our patterns in, the mi in our minds work differently. Aaron Balma, who lives with autism on the other side of the province, has had his own behavioral challenges in school. 
More than 20 years later, he still remembers being threatened with the menacing seclusion room down the hall. I must have been having a meltdown. I think I was. And, uh, you know, they, they threatened to put me in there, but I, they brought me out because I was crying. And I remember going home and talking to mom about it. And it was a steel uh, pad on the door where there would be a handle normally. But there wasn't. They would, you know, they could put you in there. And then you don't know whether you would stay in there for hours. And that was the fear. It's like we didn't know how, I didn't know how long I'd be in there. And this is me at a young age, like five, six. Like, how would I supposed to know, right? So when, a, you know, a teacher threatened a seclusion room, Aaron, mm -hmm. you know, what was happening inside of you at that time? I remember it just uh, me being petrified, terrified. Where am I? Where am I being taken? What's going to happen? Like your mind goes to the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. Aaron's now a successful military historian who builds wartime models as part of his job. He also advocates for the autism community and was shocked to find out that these rooms are still being used in Canada. There are right and wrong ways in doing things. And the problem is some people are just not trained properly to do that type of job. And where, you know, they haven't got the training, they haven't got certifications to working with high support needs. Individuals who live with autism think and process differently. A message Aaron wants educators across the country to understand. There, you know, there's certain levels of anxiety that affect me and, you know, that are different than an average person. And then there's, uh, there's definitely certain um, aspects of um, life that uh, are difficult for us, but not, might not be seen as very difficult for in our typical mindset. The teachers have to have patience. Yeah. And they have to be open to a, a scenario where there's no explanation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> in Chantal's case, educators at Lily's old school maintain that seclusion is used only for safety purposes. When Chantal complained to the Human Rights Commission in New Brunswick, they sided with the school claiming it had sought to provide as inclusive as an environment as possible, adding that Lily was monitored at all times and the door was not locked. Exhausted by the process, Chantel pulled Lily out of that district and moved her daughter more than 300 kilometers away to Rothsay, New Brunswick. Despite everything she has been through, Chantel still blames the system more than the teachers. Chantel, in your mind, what should have been done other than that seclusion room? It's such a huge conversation. It's really, it, it's a lot of training in all the moments that come before that, that can create an environment that never lead to that moment. We're not just traumatizing these children. These teachers and EAs who are doing this, don't get me, they're being traumatized as well in the moment. What do you think it is that gets people worked up? This is a crisis training program called Ukeru. Good job. It's an alternative to restraints and seclusion. Ukeru staff have taught at schools, hospitals, and even urgent care centers across North America. Today, they're teaching educators just north of Seattle, Washington. And once you do it a couple times, you'll get a feel for it. Okay. Okay. Get them all ready. It was founded by an organization based out of Virginia which at one time relied on harsh punishments for children who became aggressive. There are times where words don't work, right? So you can have a child who is escalating, or anybody who is escalating, and there are times that your words just aren't enough. And for years, we did what we knew how to do. And I, those were just the tools in our toolbox were restraint, seclusion, um, more restrictive practices, and we knew we were overusing restraint and seclusion. We knew it. Kim Sanders is the president of Ukero Systems. She trains teachers to use soft protective pads to help diffuse volatile situations, but her more compassionate approach always starts in the classroom. Every single one of us in here sometimes has a bad day. Is that true? Yeah. Really, what we're talking about is we're talking about, number one, understanding the prevalence of trauma. Then we want them to learn trauma symptoms, 
and early warning signs. Then we want them to learn how to respond to someone who you see is having a trauma reaction. And it's worked. Since Ukeru was implemented, restraints have been reduced by over 99%. And in the past decade, the use of seclusion has been eliminated. Kids do well if they can. If they cannot, it's because something is getting in their way. And it is up to the adults around the children to discover what is that is not working for them. Erica Cedillo works with Inclusion BC, a nonprofit organization that advocates for the rights of people with intellectual disabilities. She says teachers are being left to deal with challenging behaviors without the right training or support. Teachers need a lot of support. We need well-supported classrooms. And one of the things that I consider important for teachers is to have access to professionals. We cannot expect that all teachers are going to be knowledgeable in all different uh, diagnoses, um, challenges, or differences. We, we know that when teachers have access to good training, to good supports, uh, to the tools that they need, we can create those inclusive experiences and that inclusive education that we want to achieve. With a speech pathologist and an occupational therapist helping her teachers, Chantelle Hyde's daughter Lily is in a new school and thriving. Oh, she's happy, happy. This morning dropping her off, she was literally running and jumping to get into the school. And almost 2,000 kilometers away, in Espanola, Ontario, Ryan's bright light is beginning to shine again. Seclusion and restraints have never come up in his new school. He's slowly coming around like he's, you know, it's loves to go to school, comes home, he tells us all about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, we're starting to slowly get our son back. Just nine days after we met Chantal Hyde, she discovered that her daughter's new school also had a policy of restraint and seclusion. And so the family has decided to remove her from the school and are keeping her at home for now.